impact of COVID-19 in the FARC Rain Corporation process in Colombia, organized by the Rain Corporation team of Rodemos el Dialogo, or Embrace Dialogue in English. Embrace Dialogue is a transnational non-partisan network of academics and practitioners who work with different sectors of society to support peacebuilding efforts in Colombia and to contribute to the transformation of armed conflicts through the promotion of a culture of dialogue. In order to promote the implementation of the Havana Peace Agreement and reconciliation yes. efforts, Embrace Dialogue has different teams, both in the UK and Colombia, working transnationally in focus areas such as transitional justice, the Truth Commission, peace negotiations with the ELN, and the reincorporation of the FARC. In our internal meetings, but also in our events, we are keen on sharing and living the culture of dialogue, which is based on six principles. Solidarity with all of those fighting to end violence, putting ourselves in the shoes of others and helping as needed, respect, for others, whether or not we share the same opinions of, and values, trying to understand without judgment why they feel and think the way they do. Honesty, to share what we think without being afraid that others will take advantage, for it is only with truth that we can rebuild trust and overcome divisions. Generosity, to offer the best of ourselves, our time and understanding, working that the, knowing that the path to peace is neither easy nor straightforward. Self-criticism, being humble, knowing that mistakes are not only made by others and that we never stop growing. And finally, co-responsibility, knowing that to build peace, in order that to build peace, we must come together with others. With this in mind, we would like to invite you to join our culture of dialogue and to embrace our six principles during this event. If you want to know more about our organization, our events, publications and activities, you can check our website uk.rodemoseldialogo.org. And today we are very happy to host this event organized in close collaboration with the National Council of Rain Corporation, specifically the FARC component, in which we are going to discuss the challenges involved in the FARC Rain Corporation process. Now, in order to contextualize the territorial development of the Rain Corporation process, it is important to understand the diverse areas across the country where former FARC members have settled since 2016. Now, we will present some slides uh, just out of context. In 2016, and as a result of a peace agreement, the FARC members settled in 26 transition zones or zonas veredales transitorias de normalización in Spanish around the country, where they gave up their weapons and were surveyed about their basic needs and sociodemographics. The once the time frame for these temporal spaces was finished, there were two mechanisms for societal reincorporation, collective and individual. The collective reincorporation, which is our main focus today, um, was initially implemented in areas called the Territorial Spaces for Training and Reincorporation, or ETCRs in Spanish. However, and due to the complexities of the implementations of the peace agreement, some of the former FARC members decided to create their own settlements called new areas of reincorporation. Currently, uh, approximately 30% of the originally registered former FARC members are still living in the former territorial spaces for training and reincorporation, which have been renamed as small villages or centros poblados after the legal timeframe terminated in 2019. Since then, 11 territorial spaces have been relocated due to security issues and the other 12 have stayed in the same area, where several FAR collectives are developing income generating projects and organizing themselves through local councils to be recognized as villages by their municipalities. In the case of the new areas of rain corporation, they are small settlements across the country and however, they are not being recognized by the Colombian government right now. Finally, it is important to note that both the former territorial spaces and the new areas are currently facing several structural challenges regarding safety, health conditions, and overall life quality. Now we're going to see two maps. The map on the left uh, shows the location of the 24 former territorial spaces in 13 of the 32 departments of Colombia. 
territorial spaces have had support of international organizations since their inauguration in 2017. However, on the right side, we have, uh, and you can see the location of the new areas of brain corporation, which are approximately 75, according to reports from the National Council of Brain Corporation, FARC component. Now with this brief context in mind, um, I will hand over to Sergio, um, a member of Rodemos el Dialogo, who will present um, a video with voices from the territorial spaces. And then we will have a dialogue with Laura Villa, our special guest, moderated by Andre Gomez Suarez, co-founder of Embrace Dialogue, and translated by Tatiana Suarez, member of the RAIN Corporation team. Finally, we will have some time for Q&A and final remarks. We hope you enjoy the event and we're very glad to have you here. Thank you very much. And I hand over now to Sage. Thanks, Laura. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sergio Postarini. I'm a member of the Urban Corporation team of Embrace Dialogue. Uh, we are now going to show you a video that was made by eight former FARC, uh, former FARC members and signatories of the peace agreement who are going through the process of brain corporation into civil society. Uh, first, we want to thank all of them who took the time to make these videos and send them to us so we can have a deeper understanding of their situation. Uh, these people send us individual short clips from their homes in different regions of Colombia, from the North in the Caribbean region to the Amazon region in the South and from different territories in the center of the country. In these videos, they report the challenge and arising from the crisis with the coronavirus pandemic, from their own experience and perspectives, how this has directly affected them in the reincorporation process and what have been some of the solutions that have been proposed individually or collectively to overcome this, this crisis. This video uh, compiles some of the voices of the main actors in the reincorporation process who have to overcome various difficulties and challenges on a daily basis. These are the perspectives of those who have to, to struggle day by day to move forward despite the different setbacks as they are first the state's failure to comply with some of the key points of the peace agreement, second the stigmatization created by different social and political sectors, third the absence of security guarantees for peace signatories and their families, and fourth the economic and social crisis brought by the coronavirus pandemic. This is a continuous individual and collective endeavor in which thousands of Peace signatories are engaged while they maintain their commitment to peace from their territories with the resources available to them. Uh, can we please see the video now? Territorial, Simon Trinidad, Vereda Tierra. Mi nombre es Jorge Luis Hermanza Sierra, el combatiente de la FARC. Vivo en el espacio territorial Simón Trinidad, Vereda Tierra Gata. ¿Cómo ha sido mi rol dentro de la comunidad para enfrentar el COVID-19? Ya que hago parte del Comité de Salud, siempre estamos recordando el uso de las medidas de seguridad, que es el tapabocas, los guantes, antibacterial o alcohol. Pero tenemos una dificultad ya que nos toca compartir los baños y nuestros alojamientos vivió más de 10 personas. Por eso le estamos apuntando a la autoconstrucción de nuestras viviendas. Solo esperamos la ayuda de todas las personas que se nos quieran unir para que este proyecto salga adelante. Mi nombre es Marta Zapata, conocida como Tatiana Montoya. Eh, soy coordinadora del ETCR Aldemar Galán y coordinadora territorial del CNR en el departamento de Nariño. Eh, los grandes retos que hemos tenido nosotros des, son muy importantes desde el inicio del proceso de paz porque ha sido de compromiso, de seriedad y responsabilidad. Eh, ahora, en medio de esta pandemia del COVID-19, eh, enfrentamos también grandes retos 
porque la voluntad política por parte del gobierno nacional ha sido muy compleja. Eh, de una u otra forma se ha quitado el oxígeno para que podamos avanzar en lo acordado en La Habana. Eh, ¿Cómo nos encontramos en este momento nosotros, tanto comunidad combatiente como comunidad aledaña y el colectivo en general? Eh, muy convencidos y muy comprometidos con lo que tiene que ver con la prevención del COVID-19 en medio pues de las dificultades y las adversidades eh, son muy pocos los apoyos hemos solicitado un lugar de aislamiento en caso, para, en caso tal que se llegara a presentar uno de los casos afortunadamente no lo tenemos y ha sido muy complejo porque en eh, proyectos productivos en nuestro espacio eh, solamente contamos con el proyecto de Limón Taitei, donde hay 31 socios. Los otros proyectos, o sea, los demás eh, compañeros, no contamos con un proyecto productivo eh, donde podamos decir que esto estamos a las puertas del futuro para hacer una verdadera reincorporación económica. Entonces, frente a todas estas situaciones, ha sido compleja porque el tema de seguridad, pues no, no nos estamos muriendo por el COVID, sino que nos están asesinando a excombatientes y líderes y lideresas en los territorios. Eh, responsables de todo esto, pues grupos eh, al margen de la ley y el gobierno como tal no brinda unas garantías plenas donde podamos ejercer la pedagogía por la paz. Uno de los aspectos pues, que nosotros resaltamos es la creatividad, la creatividad que tenemos, las dinámicas de unidad y de solidaridad. Mi nombre es Luis Arturo Garcés Borja, eh, soy el presidente del Espacio de Reincorporación de Llano Grande. Uno de los retos acá que tenemos es eh, mantener las recomendaciones eh, para poder eh, sostener el estado de salud y en cierta forma uno de los que más nos preocupa y estamos luchando permanentemente es por cuidar eh, la zona que no resulte infectado nuestros niños eh, las mujeres en estado eh, de gestación y la gente de la tercera edad muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Jorge Colón Tuerca. Eh, eh, pues yo creo que un, un, una de las condiciones que nos tiene un poco estancados es, es por la enfermedad, o sea, por el, por el virus, que siempre nos tiene atajados por, porque no hemos podido hacer lo que hemos querido, que es trabajar con las comunidades, pero sin embargo lo estamos haciendo por grupos. Yo creo que esto es un reto que estamos enfrentando siempre difícil. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Antonio Zapata, eh, también hago parte acá a la, a la directiva Hello. del espacio. Pues yo creo que a pesar de que, de que eh, lo de la pandemia, los cuidados que hemos tenido, pues hemos continuado con el trabajo que siempre hemos querido desarrollar, hemos desarrollado con las comunidades, en las veredas cercanas, eh, al ETCR donde estamos, y con las recomendaciones que, 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 que se han tenido que que cumplir, que llevar, entonces yo creo que, que a pesar de que, de que la pandemia pues manda a restricción de muchas cosas, el trabajo se ha continuado con las precauciones obviamente necesarias. 11 de mayo del 2020, un fraternal y revolucionario saludo a todos y todas. Mi nombre es Héctor Piedradita Londoño, pero me conocen como Jacobo en el ETCR Jacobo Arango, punto de reagrupación de algunos y algunas esguerrilleros de la Fara EP en la vereda de Llano Grande del municipio de Aveiva en Antioquia. ¿De cómo estoy viviendo esta crisis? Diría que con tranquilidad, disfrutando la libertad, con la rebeldía, siendo críticos y con prudencia, nos siguen asesinando luego de los acuerdos de La Habana. Acá, en las zonas veredales, la situación es muy distinta a las ciudades. Los alimentos están en las huertas y a veces algunos podrían decir que se pierden, pero no, sirven de alimento a los animales o retornan a la tierra como abono natural, sin los dañinos químicos industriales. 
El agua es cristalina e ideal para cocer algunos frutos o plantas medicinales y tomar estos brebajes que es nuestra medicina ancestral, ya que la asistencia médica, o sea el puesto de salud, los profesionales, los medicamentos, etcétera, brillan por su ausencia. No hay mayores expectativas sobre las ayudas del Estado y las grandes empresas. Históricamente han abandonado al campesinado y permitido la explotación extranjera de estas tierras. Además, hemos sufrido la violencia que ejerce el desplazamiento, las amenazas, el despojo, la tortura, las desapariciones, los falsos positivos, el asesinato de líderes sociales, defensores de derechos humanos y exguerrilleros o exguerrilleras. En síntesis, esta crisis no es nueva. Tenemos una emergencia sanitaria, una emergencia climática, una emergencia educativa y de acceso a las telecomunicaciones, de escasez de agua, de refugiados, de víctimas de la guerra, de destrucción de los ecosistemas, de feminicidios, de corrupción. La crisis es sistemática del sistema capitalista y del consumismo y la solución debe ser igual. No basta lavarnos las manos y ponernos una mascarilla. Tenemos que construir otro mundo, si es posible, como diría el Che, con el hombre y la mujer nuevo. Nuestra tarea es organizarnos con los de abajo, con los del páramo, con los de la costa, la selva, para construir una sociedad donde no entre el virus del capital. Gracias. Mi nombre es Esperanza, hago parte del Espacio Territorial de Agua Bonita, Héctor Ramírez. En estos momentos, pues, el momento más importante, sobre todo el tema de la pandemia del COVID-19, para mí, pues, ha sido como nos nos hemos acostumbrado pues a continuar con los trabajos colectivos desde las partes que ya no podemos reunirnos todos sino a partir de videoconferencias y para el trabajo colectivo de nosotros pues esto nos ha enseñado más, más cómo tenemos que aprendernos a cuidarnos y autocuidarnos también el reto más importante que hemos tenido nosotros para enfrentar la pandemia pues ha sido a través de las campañas que hemos podido hacer, videoconferencia, el, los casacasos que hemos podido establecer y también las normas que se han creado por la propia comunidad a través de la Junta de Acción Comunal, pues para cuidarnos de la pandemia del COVID-19 en nuestro territorio. Mi nombre es Lexi Ruiz, hago parte del poblado Héctor Ramírez de la Montañita Caquetá. Eh, lo, uno de los retos más importantes que nosotros hemos tenido en, este, en esta pandemia del COVID-19 pues ha sido hacer una socialización con la comunidad, el poblado, para eh, dar a entender la importancia de lo que tiene que ver la salud en nuestro medio y con, las población, y con la población aledaña también. Este reto, con este reto también hemos buscado algunas estrategias para darle solución a esto, que son todas las, las la, lo que hemos podido hacer medi, mediante los medios de comunicación o las, eh, las casa a casas que se han hecho, las visitas que se han hecho para poder pues que se generen algunas estrategias de cuidado ambiental, de higiene, eh, a pesar del abandono del Estado y todas las dificultades que tenemos aquí, eh, la gente ha podido pues entender la necesidad que hay y se han acogido a estas, a estas estrategias y han atendido pues como todos los protocolos de seguridad y bioseguridad de nuestra comunidad. Pues para comentarle lo que está sucediendo con la crisis de la pandemia en nuestro país y lo que está sucediendo también por las masacres de los líderes y lideresas en Colombia que hay más muertes de líderes y lideresas en Colombia y de antiguos guerrilleros de las Har. están muriendo cada día y donde no lo pasan en los noticieros no lo hacen conocer al mundo y, y en los ETCRs estamos luchando por seguir sobreviviendo inclusive en nuestro ETCR a pesar de que es uno de los más abandonados del país y del estado colombiano en cabeza del presidente Iván Duque y también de los antiguos camaradas representantes de las FARC. 
no han hecho gran cosa por tal de que este TCR tenga un mejor rendimiento y una mejor adecuación de vida para los que estamos en este TCR a pesar de que estamos siendo en estos últimos días estamos siendo amenazados de que no solamente a mí sino a muchos de mis compañeros de que nos nos tienen en la lista grupos enemigos de la paz y para comentarle que esto del COVID-19 ha sido muy trascendental y es uno de los únicos países del mundo donde se ha lucrado y, ha, y han aprovechado los grandes que no creemos la guerra que lo que único con los ideales de la paz y que nosotros no queremos guerra que nosotros creemos es vivir y seguir viviendo muchas gracias ok I hope that you have enjoyed this video um... I would really like to start then this part of our uh, event by first thanking uh, the team of Brain Corporation of Rodemos el Dialogo. I think these videos show precisely the voices of the people who are going through this very complex process of Brain Corporation. We wanted, of course, to meet with, uh, with Laura Villa to hear all the efforts that they are doing from Bogota, but we also wanted to hear, or we wanted you to hear the voices of the former combatants of the FARC in some of the rain corporation areas in Colombia because their voice cannot be replaced. With this in mind, we hope that this video and this space um, makes us all aware of the effort that we can play in reincorporation. And we really hope that with this framing, we will be able to make the most of this event. So I'm deeply thankful to Laura Villa for joining us. Uh, and before I explain the role of the games, I would like just to ask Laura if she's listening to us okay, if she can hear us, and also to get to know if we can listen to her when she talks to us. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias a Rodemos al Diálogo por este espacio. Los saludo desde Bogotá. Aquí me encuentro con mi hija de tres años. Me disculpan si en algún momento me ausento para atender el llamado de mi hija. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Villa, and thank you to the Embrace Dialogue team. And I am here in Bogotá. I'm here in my home with my three-year-old daughter. So I apologize in advance if I at some um, Unexpectedly, I have to leave to be with my daughter. Perfect. So we can hear you okay. That's amazing. I just uh, want to explain how we are going to do this part of the event. Um, the idea is that we are going to have a semi structured dialogue with Laura for about 30 minutes. Uh, we will see. We have prepared some questions that we want to ask her. Tatiana Suarez, member of the RAIN Corporation team, very kindly has agreed to do the translation. We wanted you to hear the voice of Laura. For that reason, we are not doing simultaneous translation. We are letting her speak, and then Laura would do translations as she is going along. You are very welcome to write questions in the chat while we are holding the dialogue, if you wish. But we also want to open the microphone for you to ask questions once we finish this dialogue with Laura Villa. So if you have those questions, then please keep them for the moment in which we open for Q&A. A final thing in terms of the questions that you may wish to ask is that we would like to ask you to do the questions in English, regardless of you speaking Spanish or not. In particular, because it would make our work easier in order to do the translation for Laura and for Tatiana to do her work. So, um, and then we would also ask you 
that if you're gonna make any question or any comments, that please try to do them slowly and pausely so that La Tatiana can do the translation in the most accurate way to Laura Villa. With that in mind, then we will start our dialogue and we very much hope that you enjoy it. So Laura, it's really important for us as Rodemos El Dialogo to have you here. You know, civil society cannot give their back to the people who are in the reincorporation process. And we as Rodemos El Dialogo want to set an example that we can contribute whatever little we can in order to make this happen. But in order for all the people who are sitting here with us who have registered for this event, I think it would be very important to know who is Laura Villa, what expectations you had before the reincorporation process started, and how are you feeling these days with the developments of the reincorporation process um, during the Duque administration? Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh... Yo soy primero colombiana, nací en Boyacá, en una familia de seis hijos. Eh, terminé medicina en la Universidad Nacional y por el contexto económico, político, social y militar de Colombia, decidí mi ingreso a las FARC en el año 2013. Uh, thank you very much. I am Colombian. I was born in the province of Boyacá. I come from a family of six children. I studied medicine at the National University. And uh, because of the political, social, economic and military context in which I was, uh, in which I grew up, I decided to join the FARC in 2003. Cuando, cuando yo conocí las FARC, no, no iba a ingresar, no era pues mi decisión como era ingreso pero al conocer las condiciones de la ruralidad y la situación que se estaba viviendo en el país, eso me llevó a tomar la decisión. Um, initially, when I first came in contact with the FARC, it was not my plan, my plan to join the organization. But looking at the precarious situation of Colombian countryside, I decided to join them. Eh, en las FARC apoyé sobre todo temas de salud, pues por... Por, por mi profesión. Um, because of my training as a, as, a, as a doctor, I mainly perform roles to do with healthcare uh, inside the organization. Y frente a mis expectativas antes, pues eh, es importante un poco destacar que al interior de la organización de las FARC siempre estuvo dentro de su plataforma política la salida dialogada al conflicto armado. Um, with regard to my expectations before the peace process, it is important to highlight that as part of our political project, there is always um, very important for us to contemplate a negotiated solution to the armed conflict. Es decir, mis expectativas durante mi permanencia en las FARC y después siempre han estado relacionadas con un proceso de transformación social hacia buscar mayor equidad en nuestro país. Uh, that is to say that my expectations before and after the peace process have always been the same and they are related to contributing to the social transformation to reduce the inequalities in my country. Eh, cuando decidimos en las FARC eh, apoyar los diálogos y firmar la paz, sabíamos que el Estado no iba a cumplir. However, when we decided to uh, enter negotiations with the government, we knew that the government was not going to hold or fully hold uh, its part of the agreement. Pero oh, en este caso se dio algo diferente a los, a los demás intentos de acuerdo de paz que se dieron, que ya pues fueron cuatro, y fue el apoyo de la sociedad civil y el apoyo de la comunidad internacional. Eso nos dio confianza. Um, but this case was different, uh, different from previous uh, attempts, four previous attempts at negotiating peace, and that was uh, the support of the civil society, but also the support of the international community. That gave us uh, more confidence to go ahead with the peace process. 
pues para nosotros poder continuar con nuestro proyecto político, lo que necesitábamos era garantizar el derecho a la vida para, pues, para seguir desarrollando este proyecto de transformación. But in order to advance our political project, the most important thing was to make sure that uh, our lives uh, were protected to guarantee our, our right to, to live uh, in order to continue with our project uh, of social transformation. Ahora, eh, la implementación del acuerdo de paz sufre serias dificultades. Uh, the implementation of the peace agreement is currently facing a lot of difficulties. Eh, la estrategia de implementación del acuerdo está desfinanciada y ya hay cerca de 200 firmantes del acuerdo de paz eh, asesinados en toda la geografía colombiana. Um, the implementation is lacking resources and currently there are approximately 200 uh, signatories of the peace agreement who have been assassinated um, around the country. Sin embargo, continuamos con nuestra disposición de seguir construyendo paz. Entendemos que esto es un proceso. Um, however, um, we want to reaffirm our commitment to the peace agreement and we want to, and to peace building and uh, we know that this is a process and we want to continue. Y han ocurrido cosas importantes. Por ejemplo, ahora estoy con mi familia y estoy con mi hija. And there are important things uh, for me on a personal level. For example, at the moment I am with my family and with my daughter. Y entendemos que la implementación del acuerdo de paz no está en manos del presidente Duque, sino está en manos de la sociedad civil y en todo el apoyo internacional que se pueda recibir para poder de alguna manera garantizar la implementación de los acuerdos de paz. And we know that the implementation of the peace agreement is not the responsibility of the president Ivan Duque, uh, but we need the support of uh, civil society and the international community to continue with this endeavor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That's uh, amazing. And uh, I think a very moving uh, account of um, the expectations that you had and a very worrying picture of the lack of security guarantees and economic guarantees for the reincorporation of the FARC that you've been telling us. Um, also, I think it's very important what you have highlighted, uh, the important uh, role that the international community and civil society have played in strengthening your own trust on a very complex process in which you understand that is very complex to, uh, to go through these uh, peace building mechanisms. Now I would like to ask you a second question that is got to do mainly with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, in particular in the reincorporation of the FARC. So we can see that in the past already the, the, the reincorporation of the FARC was going through very serious challenges. Well, what has been the impact of the coronavirus pandemic and how you know you have facing or continue facing more challenges? Bueno, indudablemente el, el fenómeno de la pandemia por el coronavirus es un fenómeno social a nivel mundial. Um, undoubtedly, the coronavirus phenomenon is affecting the whole world. Sin embargo, en Colombia y en el contexto profundizado brechas de desigualdad. However, in Colombia, um, this crisis has exacerbated existing um, inequality and social problems. Se han, se han visibilizado aún más los problemas estructurales en los cuales se encuentra la reincorporación y las diferencias entre el campo y la ciudad. Um, it has become more visible, um, the structural problems of our society and the huge differences between uh, the cities and rural areas in Colombia. 
como ustedes miraron en la exposición, la mayoría de los espacios territoriales y nuevas áreas de reincorporación se encuentran en áreas rurales. As you were able to see in the introduction of the event, uh, most of the um, reincorporation spaces and the new areas of reincorporation are in rural areas. Donde no hay conectividad, no hay saneamiento básico, no hay agua potable. Um, in this area, there are serious deficiencies of connectivity, um, but also health services and uh, uh, water. No hay eh, puestos de salud para atención médica y los sitios donde se está desarrollando la reincorporación, las viviendas, son unas viviendas construidas en su superboar, como un cartón duro. Um, yeah, in those areas, um, there is a serious lack of um, health care centers and also um, our houses. The accommodation is very rustic. It's made of superboard, which is um, not a very durable material. Sin embargo, esta pandemia también, o un poco analizándola desde la complejidad, nos ha podido... Eh, conoce cómo desarrollar e impulsar eh, procesos con las comunidades que han sido muy positivos. Um, however, uh, despite the complexity of this crisis, um, we have been able to develop uh, interesting processes with uh, the local communities. Por ejemplo, hay proyectos productivos que, que se han eh, focalizado a la producción de tapabocas, a la producción de máquinas eh, para, eh, para limpieza, para eh, eh, el caso, el donación de tapabocas a las comunidades. Um, for example, some of those uh, productive projects that the FARC have been involved in include the uh, making of face masks and also um, cleaning machines. And uh, we have been donating uh, face masks uh, to the local communities. Y también se han consolidado procesos de articulación entre las firmantes del Acuerdo de Paz y comunidades aledañas para cuidar su entorno. And uh, other processes um, between the, the, the far community and, and the local communities have strengthened in order to look after each other among, um, in the middle of this crisis. Para control de entrada de personal, control de entrada de alimento, limpieza de los carros que entran. Entonces han sido por procesos comunitarios muy significativos que han podido generar procesos de empoderamiento y autonomía comunitaria para la protección de la salud. Procesos de empoderamiento y autonomía comunitaria para el cuidado de la salud. Um, the, the far community and the local communities have been controlling uh, the access of people inside the reintegration areas, food, um, and this has uh, contributed to the interaction between the two groups and to empowering the, the links between those communities. Okay. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I think you know you have showed us how the structural inequalities uh, uh, are being uh, have deepened uh, thanks to the coronavirus crisis. But you have also shown us how, um, by a resourceful decision, both of the peace uh, signatories and of the communities in the regions, uh, the this, the, 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 the regions have been able to cope with new measures needed in order to stop the spread of the pandemic. Now I would like to ask you, like in particular, focusing more on that uh, second element that you were telling us, whether you could share with us some anecdotes of the most creative solutions probably that have been found uh, in this moment in order to deal with the pandemic uh, in different 
in, in, in the different reincorporation areas of the country. Bueno, eh, primero me parece importante resaltar que las FARC como organización insurgente duró, eh, estuvo durante, de, estuvo en el, en el conflicto durante 53 años. Um, yes, I would like to say <laughs> that the FARC as an insurgent organization uh, was in the, um, was part of the armed struggle for 53 years. Esos 53 años de conflicto no solamente eh, de eh, en, en, no fueron solo experiencia de manejo de armas, eh, fueron también experiencias de, de la atención de nuestra propia salud, de la elaboración de nuestras propias vi viviendas, de desarrollo de, de, no sé, de, de actividades alimentarias diarias, de construcción de campamentos. Entonces traemos unas capacidades de la historia del conflicto que en este momento se pusieron eh, pon que se pudieron poner a prueba con las comunidades. In those uh, 53 years, uh, Laura, ponle, uh, um, sorry about that. Um, in those 53 years, um, we gain important experience, not just with the use of weapons, but we also gain valuable experience uh, in terms of health, building our own homes, um, preparing our foods, and uh, we gain uh, important capabilities and skills that are now being useful uh, during the uh, pandemia, uh, pandemia crisis. Entonces, en esta última época eh, hemos visto, eh, quisiera resaltar la, la experiencia en Miravalle, que es un espacio territorial que está en el Caquetá. Um, So I would like to highlight um, the experience of uh, one of the reincorporation areas in Miravalle in the province of Caquetá in the south of Colombia. Allá no había tubería para el acueducto, para, el, para los alcantarillados. Y su construcción se realizó con la participación de exguerrilleros, firmantes de paz, las comunidades, pero también las fuerzas militares. So for example, they didn't have running water in Miravalle and uh, the three groups, the former combatants, the community, but also the armed forces participating in making sure that there was water supply for, for this reincorporation area. Esto es una muestra quizás no solamente de cómo se afronta, afronta la pandemia, sino cómo se van construyendo procesos de paz en los territorios. So this is an example, not just how to cope with the challenges of the COVID-19, but also how to uh, build peace in the territories. Y pues indudablemente, pues para, para nosotros pesa el, el trabajo que se está haciendo desde Icononza, un espacio territorial del Tolima. And it is also important to highlight the work that it's being done in the reintegration area of Icononso in Tolima province. Donde su producción de tapabocas está beneficiando a las personas que se encuentran en las cárceles de Bogotá, que no han tenido una atención por parte del Estado. In Icononso, uh, the Excuse me. Um, yeah, in Icononso, um, the uh, former guerrillas are making face masks that are being distributed in the prisons in Bogota where the uh, local governments or the state are not providing these essential items. Y el solo hecho de que todos los proyectos o muchos de los proyectos productivos que se estén desarrollando en la reincorporación se enfoquen en, en aportar a so, so, dar soluciones desde el punto de vista de la prevención, pues es un aspecto importante. 
Um, another important aspect uh, is that we are focusing on uh, prevention. Okay. Thank you, Laura. That's uh, really good. I think it probably for people to understand the importance of these face masks that have been distributed in prisons in Colombia, I should add that uh, according to some of the estimates of the Ministry of Health in Colombia, more than 7% of the people who have uh, coronavirus in Colombia today are in Colombian prisons. And the prison situation in Colombia has been very complicated since the coronavirus pandemic started. There are more than 950 people who have coronavirus. So this gesture of producing face masks to be sent to prisons in Bogota show how these sectors of Colombian society that are in the process of the reincorporation can contribute to deal with very serious issues and challenges that sometimes not even the Colombian state can deal with. Laura, I wonder whether I could ask you a final question before we open up for, um, for other questions from the floor. And I would like to ask you in terms of uh, the numbers of uh, members uh, of the FARC with coronavirus. Do you have any member of the FARC who has been, who's got the virus? Do you have a statistics about that? Have they been treated? Has anyone from the FARC has died because of coronavirus? I think that would be something very important for us to understand uh, in this context of this meeting. Sí, yo, eh, tenemos dos casos reportados, pero es en Bogotá. Ellos están recibiendo atención por la red de salud. Um, we have two reported cases, but they're both in Bogotá and they have been uh, dealt with by the National Health Network. Y tuvimos un, un caso de riesgo eh, cuando se estaban distribuyendo los alimentos en el ETCR de Planadas. Pues la persona que, que, eh, un, pues la persona que estaba distribuyendo los alimentos se contagió y había riesgo de que hubieran tenido contacto con las personas de Planadas. Uh -huh. Um, there was also um, uh, an alert in uh, Planadas with one person who was distributing the food to the reintegration area who um, uh, developed the symptoms, so, so this person had to be isolated. Eh, Planadas is a space with 70 firmantes del acuerdo, and now we are in a moment of alert and of seguimiento to symptoms that can be presented. Planadas is an area with 70 signatories of the peace agreement. So at the moment, uh, the area is under observation and um, everyone is taking care to detect uh, anyone who has uh, been, has potentially contracted the virus. In the Department of Putumayo, we had the death of a baby of three months. And in the southern province of Putumayo, a, a three-month-old baby died porque no pudo tener acceso a salud, no estaba afiliado y uh, murió, murió por una infección de piel, le hicieron el examen de coronavirus, salió negativo. Um, this baby um, was tested for COVID-19 and it was negative, but he had uh, a serious infection that couldn't be treated because uh, the family was not registered with um, the um, health system. Pero esto es una imagen de lo que están viviendo los niños de la paz, los niños que son hijos de los firmantes del acuerdo de paz. Um, this reflects the situation that many children are going through. Um, these are the children of peace, those children that uh, were born after the signing of the peace agreement. Thank you, Laura. I would like to uh, invite you 
to either raise your hand in order to give you the chance to ask a question or to write it down in our chat because as you know, Rodemos el Dialogo or Embrace Dialogue is all about a dialogue between the participants and the guest speakers. So we don't wanna take and monopolize this space uh, and we would really want to give you the chance to do that. I've seen that there is a quest one question, but I would like to probably collect two more. So we do rounds of questions. Uh, see, if you give me your indication, I would then give you the word. And for you to think, meanwhile, your question, I'm gonna ask a final question to, to Laura that, that came up to my mind. Um, and is, uh, Laura, you have talked about the killings of almost 200 uh, members of the FARC. Um, how many of them had happened after the coronavirus pandemic started? Do you have the numbers? Have the killings of members of the FARC continue in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic? And this has this something to do with the lockdown so that you cannot leave the territories and or, or, or not? Eh, pues eh, hay una relación de cerca de 26 asesinatos después de, del inicio de la cuarentena. Lo contamos como hacia mitad de enero para acá. Um, yes, there has been approximately um, 26 uh, deaths since the beginning of the quarantine and um, we are, we started counting from the beginning of Jan January. Tenemos el caso de dos espacios territoriales, uno de Ituango de Antioquia y otro del Cauca, donde los firmantes del acuerdo de paz han sido desplazados por eh, amenazas de muerte por parte del paramilitarismo. And we also have two cases, one in Ituango in Antioquia and another one in Cauca, where uh, two people have been displaced because they have received death threats from paramilitary groups. Hace cerca de, de una semana tuvimos el, el caso de un compañero de Antioquia, de Medellín, quien estaba liderando el proyecto productivo de, de arreglo de motos que fue asesinado e incinerado en, en, en un barrio de la comuna de Medellín. And we also have the case of one of our comrades about a week ago in Medellín, Antioquia. Uh, he was the leader of a productive project and they were uh, involved in uh, repairing motorbikes. He was killed and his body was incinerated. Lo, lo que uno puede evidenciar es que hay un, 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 una intencionalidad sistemática por, pues, por un lado, atacar el acuerdo de paz y eh, por eh, no, asesinar eh, a, a los firmantes de la. Um, what we can see is that these um, attacks. Um, to the peace process and to the lives of the signatories of the peace agreement are deliberate and systematic. Thank you so much, Laura. So I, I have for the time being um, two questions and then a comment uh, that I will read after the two questions for you to make a clarification perhaps. Uh, so um, I'm gonna ask Gwen Bornet to please ask uh, the first question. Uh, and if you could switch on your camera when you ask your question, that's great. Thank you so much. And then we will go to Laura Gravini. Gwen. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, just, I wanna say thanks to the Rain Corporation team for organizing this fantastic event and for this really impressive video. Um, and thank you so much to Laura for coming and spending time uh, talking to us and telling us a bit about the situation um, and giving us that, important overview and I think I speak for all of the members of Rodemos en Dialogo when I say that your commitment to uh, peace in these really complex circumstances is really inspiring and um, we all stand here in solidarity with the difficulties that you're facing. 
Um, my question is about the political party. And I wondered how, um, how, because I guess it's very important for many of the members of FARC in the different areas where they're reincorporating to feel connected to the broader project um, of the political party. And I wondered if there'd been uh, in an impact um, on the activities of the party uh, in the context of the pandemic. And thank you again. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you so much. We are going to go now to Laura. Uh, just a second, Andre. Do you want me to translate the question or just leave it for later? Uh, to, I thought you had translated the question to Laura Villa. Yeah, but uh, she needs repetition. <laughs> OK, so. What, what I can say. Um... No, just one second. Just I'll, I'll say quickly. Don't worry. Yeah. Thank you, Gwen. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Just a second. Okay. Thank so you, Andre. Second question. So we're going to go to Laura, Laura Gravini now. Uh, Laura, and le, yeah. So le, le, let me ask you again to try to do the questions slowly so that Tatiana can do the translation. So try to be, if you are going to stand a bit making a comment or, you know, the question is a bit long, try to pause so that Tatiana can translate and Laura can digest and then we can get back. So amazing. Uh, over to Laura Gravini. Microphone to Laura. Is that, is that good? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Great, sorry. Sorry about the messy background. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for your like for giving us your time. It's very interesting to hear what has actually happened and to shine the light on an issue that tends to be just completely um, forgotten because of the pandemic. I guess that what I wanted to ask you is, why do you think that it is in the moment of crisis that different sectors of society tend to come together? Like for example, from your story in Miravalle, where you have the military forces, the community and the signatories of peace like coming together. Like why do you think that crisis like fosters this kind of scenario? And what do you think will happen when the situation like neutralizes and we are back to a context after the pandemic, like what are your expectations of reincorporation after coronavirus is over? How do you think the dynamics with society will change? Thank you, Laura. I hope, yeah, no worries, Tatiana, you go ahead. Um, let's, I will remind you again, slowly because the translation needs to takes a bit of time, but, but we are doing great. Fantastic. And the, then, <laughs> then the comment that, uh, that uh, Sarah Koopman has made is that she said that she understands that uh, not only two people were displaced because of the death threats by paramilitary groups, but she understands that in two entire territorial spaces were displaced and people have to move away from those, uh, from those territorial spaces. Is that the case or is that a different case that happened before and that these two cases that you were talking about happened in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic? Was I too fast? Fine, thank you. So we will, we will give the chance to Laura Villa to respond to these three questions. And then I'm very happy to see that, um, that uh, uh, there are some other questions coming ahead. So let's give the chance to Laura to reply. Frente, frente, a, la, frente a la primer pregunta, eh, indudablemente con toda la idea de la implementación de los acuerdos, Y con todas las dificultades, pues los firmantes del acuerdo de paz de alguna manera han responsabilizado al partido. 
Um, so um, answering question one, um, it is some, um, the situation is that with this um, pandemic crisis, um, members of the or signatories of the peace agreement are blaming uh, the FARC delegates, the, the people who are supposed to represent them. Porque en los tiempos del conflicto, eh, los comandantes eh, de las FARC eran los que debían dar solución a todo. Eso ha generado un poco de tensiones al interior del partido. Um, because uh, during wartime, uh, it was the commander's responsibility to look after uh, their rank and file. So this has created a little bit of tension in, during the current crisis. Entonces, al interior de las FARC, del partido que se genera a partir del acuerdo, también estamos en un proceso de construcción, en un proceso pedagógico. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. So, yeah, I mean, in, in the middle of this crisis, we are also learning and we are building our political party from within and we are learning. This is, this is also a process like reincorporation. Y, y en un proceso de poder identificar toda la, la situación que ocurre en los territorios y las necesidades para poder generar salidas, salidas creativas. No todo depende del Estado, es cierto. Gran parte si hay, si hay una responsabilidad, pero nosotros también tenemos que, que, que generar salidas y generar posibilidades. Um, so what the party is doing is just trying to collect information from all the areas and to be able to provide creative solutions because we are aware that not everything uh, depends on the on the state. Uh, we also have to um, provide our own solutions. Laura, before Laura, before you go to the second question, could could I just ask you a clarification? Because as far as I understand, the party leaders used to travel to the regions and visit most of the reincorporation areas. But now with the pandemic, they cannot visit the reincorporation areas. And so the question is, is that having also an impact in the party itself to be able to, 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 you know, to build a strong sense of belonging? Pues hemos tratado, eso es cierto. Eso es, es eso lo que tú dices es, es real. Pero sin embargo también hemos tratado de utilizar eh, la conectividad, un mensaje de WhatsApp para poder estar conectados e informados y sobre todo articulados en este proceso. That is very true, Andre. Uh, however, uh, we have tried to stay in contact. We have been using uh, technology, um, sending a WhatsApp message just to confirm that we are connect connected, that we are working together and, and that we're still uh, together. Eh, frente, al, frente a la segunda pregunta, um... En el contexto del conflicto siempre estuvimos en dificultades, ¿sí? siempre estuvo como en juego la vida. With regards to the second question, why um, do people come together in times of crisis? Well, when we were during the conflict, we were always uh, uh, in the middle of danger because our lives were always at risk. Considero que este momento es un momento difícil que nos transporta a, a poder traer capacidades De, de desempeñarnos en medio de las dificultades y poder transmitir como esa, esas, eh, esos procesos de, de poder eh, trabajar en medio de las dificultades a las comunidades. So this um, crisis has been an opportunity to transmit the message to the communities that we can work together to go through uh, difficult moments. Para esto, has, para esto ha sido fundamental El trabajo colectivo, la solidaridad, el compañerismo 
y sobre todo pues la reflexión frente a lo que es la vida y lo que es lo prioritario. So it has been essential uh, to work collaboratively, uh, to, to share experiences, to reflect, but also to understand that life takes priority over other things. Eh, después de la crisis, no, pues mis expectativas es continuar dándolo todo por el proceso de reincorporación. Eh, siento un compromiso, o sea, creo que mi compromiso es con la gente y con todos los que firmaron la paz y tengo la oportunidad de estar en un escenario donde puedo ayudar. Tatiana, micrófono. No, perdón. I'm sorry, um, just uh, too many things. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so um, Laura was saying that, uh, yes, um, uh, when things return to normality, um, they are going to continue to build peace because they have a commitment, especially with those who are signatories of the peace agreement. And uh, Laura is saying that she is in a privileged position because she works for the uh, Reincorporation Council. So she's basically going to continue after, the, after everything returns to normality. And I think we have now a comment, Andre, but if you could please summarize it very quickly. Um, it's something to do with precision about displacement into reintegration areas. So if you could just please quickly uh, uh, that comment again. We would like to know whether the, the, the displacement that she has been mentioning is of two people or of two entire reincorporation areas because of the threat of paramilitary groups. Ok, fueron dos espacios de reincorporación. El de Ituango, con cerca de 100 personas, tuvieron que salir y dejar sus proyectos productivos. Y en el Cauca, también cerca de 94 personas. O sea, estamos hablando de comunidad, colectivos enteros. It was um, entire reincorporation areas. The first one was in Ituango in Antioquia where nearly 100 people had to leave because of those threats and they had to abandon their agricultural projects. And in Cauca, uh, about 94 people. Uh, so we are talking about entire collectives of uh, FARC people. Thank you, Tatiana. Ellos ahora son desplazados del conflicto, ¿no? And uh, now they've just become um, displaced people uh, from the Colombian conflict, like many others. Have they moved into the new areas of reincorporation? Or, or, or where are they living at the moment? Eh, los de Ituango están en Medellín. Están buscando refugios. Y los del Cauca eh, también están cerca de Popayán. Eh, o sea, se han, se han acercado a las cabeceras urbanas, pero no hay unas garantías como de vivienda y de sostenibilidad. Uh, those from the Ituango area, and I'm going to clarify here, this is, these are rural areas, they have moved to Medellín, uh, which is the province capital. And those from the reintegration area in Cauca, are around Popayán, again, another city. Uh, so they have been looking for safety in, um, in metropolitan areas, but there's no guarantees of um, provide, uh, that the government is going to provide accommodation or even safety for their life. Laura, a very quick question, and then I will give the chance to someone else to ask a question, and is to do with, have you been using Zoom in order to have meetings with uh, some of the members of the different reincorporation areas across the country, since you were talking about technology.
Sí, sí, eh, hemos hecho, hemos, créanme que lo bueno de esta pandemia es que reflexionando nos hemos comunicado más en esta época que antes. Entonces, pues, estamos sacándole provecho también a todo eso. Um, she says, uh, yes, we have uh, taken this opportunity to learn and we have been using the, the different tools available to us. And uh, now that we reflect upon it, we have been communicating even more than we did before. We are taking advantage of this crisis. Perfect. Thank you, Laura. Okay, Ariana, you have a question. So the, micro the microphone is yours. Please turn on your camera and ask your question. Hey, uh, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Laura. Um, so my question, um, a little bit dark, sorry, but um, uh, do you believe that the pandemic is um, affecting men and women differently during this time, um, both socially and physically? Uh, I know in general worldwide that domestic violence uh, has increased since quarantine. Um, but has there also been an increase in violence uh, within the, uh, the territories as well? Amazing, thank you. I think we're gonna do one-on-one, -on -one. it works much better. So, Sí, sí, desafortunadamente también se ha, se ha incrementado el tema de, de, de la pues, violencia intrafamiliar, han sucedido casos, mm, se ha recargado el tema de cuidado también en las mujeres, desafortunadamente sí ha ocurrido, pues hemos tenido que eh, desarrollar acciones para apoyar a la mujer en los territorios en ese aspecto. Um, yes, um, unfortunately, that has also happened in the reintegration areas. Um, there has been an increase in domestic violence, and there's also um, a disproportionate um, amount of work on women um, who have to look after uh, others. And um, they have been developing strategies to address that. Perfect. Uh, I guess now we have uh, Gwen, who uh, also said that she's got a question from someone on Facebook. Um, so I'll be very grateful, Gwen, if you could read that first and then um, we answer that question and then you'll ask your second question. Thank you. Yeah, the question is from Pipe, member of Rodemos en Dialogo in Colombia, and his question is what are specific actions that civil society can do to support the reincorporation process? Pues eh, pienso que, que la principal acción es la defensa de los acuerdos de paz. Um, I think that the main thing is that um, we all uh, stand up and defend the implementation of the peace agreement. Eh, por otro lado, pues también hay, hay procesos eh, de la sociedad civil es mucho. Hay procesos de la academia que pueden apoyar la reincorporación en temas de proyectos productivos, vivienda. Um, on the other hand, there are also other uh, processes that the civil society can support because um, civil society is composed by many sectors. So, for example, um, academics uh, can support productive or housing projects. La sociedad civil también son las empresas privadas que pueden apalancar procesos de comercialización de los productos de los territorios que se dan en la reincorporación. And also the private sector, they can contribute to the commercialization of the agricultural products that are uh, produced in their incorporation area. Y pues indudablemente todas eh, en, 
las ONG y, y en general se requiere como un acompañamiento a los espacios territoriales eh, en el tema de, de, de la pedagogía de paz. Es, eso es algo, nosotros firmamos el acuerdo, eh, sí, es cierto, pero, pero falta pedagogía y ni siquiera el acuerdo final se ha conocido como, como es en su esencia. Yes, um, also uh, we require the support of NGOs and, um, and in general what we need is more peace pedagogy because we signed a uh, very um, complex agreements but uh, we need to learn about them. There are so many people who haven't even read the document of the agreement. So peace pedagogy is important. Laura. No, simplemente ahora sobre el tema de seguridad eh, la denuncia de qué es lo que está pasando, que, que pues hay muchas cosas como decía en el video que no salen en los medios, las redes también juegan un papel importante mostrando la realidad que sucede con los firmantes del acuerdo de paz y, su, y, y, y pues el riesgo que corre sus vidas. Um, and uh, with regards to security, it is important that civil society keep on uh, reporting and making known uh, what is happening. As it was mentioned in the video, some of the things that happen sometimes are not widely um, covered by the news. So it's important that uh, people use social media um, to, to keep on reporting uh, that the um, people's lives are being threatened. On that point of the productive projects, I just wanted to ask you whether uh, there is an online website in which we could buy some of the products produced uh, by the FARC, uh, or whether the face masks, or whether the Cerveza La Roja, or whether you know any of these other products, and that we could probably be aware of in order to support the the the, the you know the economic products that you have in the regions. Pues existe una, una, una organización de economía solidaria que se llama Ecomun. Ella está como rodeando todos los procesos productivos de reincorporación. Ahí hay información al respecto. ¿Y qué es la website? Eh, pues me tocaría como un poco organizar la información. Eh, pues eh, si, no, si no está... Ahí quizás no esté todo porque consolidar esa información es, es, pues ha sido también complejo, pero con la información del CNR y con la información de, de común, pues podemos eh, hacer como un portafolio de productos que se estén dando de la reincorporación. Um, so Laura was telling us that um, basically all the different, um, the different individual economic projects are under an umbrella of sol uh, solidarity economy, which is called Ecomun, and they do have a website so that they can centralize all these different uh, individual initiatives. Yeah, she says at the moment, not everything is contained because it's a very complex process, uh, but together with the Brain Corporation Council, they can collect and all this information and create a portfolio so that is disseminated and uh, people have more information about these um, initiatives. Perfect, so um, I guess before we go back to Gwen, I wanna ask you this question that has been uh, put forward by uh, Laura Alejandra Chaparro in London. She's saying, now that you experience the complexity of the reincorporation process uh, with the FARC, what would be your message for the ELN who is thinking about possible negotiated solution with the, with the government? Eh, pues yo eh, diría que el camino a la paz es un camino largo. Estamos empezando. Entonces, no, no, no es empezar de ceros. Ya hay unas lecciones aprendidas. Entonces es un poco recoger esas lecciones aprendidas y siempre eh, la salida dialogada es una oportunidad. Um, I would like to tell them that the 
path of peace is a long one and we are only starting. Um, but for the ELN, they wouldn't have to start from scratch because there are already so many lessons to learn. So I would tell them to take those lessons. And uh, I, would, I would say that um, peace is, is always the right path. Thank you, Laura. I guess I would like to make a, a, an important clarification uh, that is being put on the on the chat for everyone. If you are not aware of this, and uh, the the new areas of reincorporation need to be supported by Colombian civil society because they are not yet recognized by the Colombian state. So the Colombian state only recognize a small part of the reincorporation areas that are the ones who were agreed in the, in the, in the agreement, but not the 75 new areas of reincorporation that uh, Laura Fonseca showed you in the map at the beginning of this talk. And uh, let's have that clarity that I think is quite important. Then I guess we can, um, we can go back to Gwen, who also had a question, and then we will continue going down that I've seen some other comments. So Gwen, could you ask your next question, please? Yeah, thank you so much. My question is about the experience um, that you're having, Laura, in the uh, reincorporation council. Uh, here in Rodemos el Dialogo, we're very concerned about the suspension of the CECIVI. And the I would like to know, is the reincorporation council still a space in which the FARC and the government have a bilateral dialogue? And what is that experience in having dialogue with the counterpart in the council like for you? Eh, sí, mira, eh, cuando tú revisas el Acuerdo de Paz, eh, el Consejo Nacional de Reincorporación es una instancia donde participa el gobierno y las FARC, pero no hay un plan a largo plazo. O sea, esto lo vamos construyendo día a día y eso ha sido como lo más difícil. Cierra el micrófono. Tatiana, microphone. <laughs> it says, if you read the document of the peace agreement, it establishes that the National Rank Corporation Council is an entity where the FARC and the government work together, but it, there is not a plan. So the plan is being built as it goes. So Laura was telling us that this process, it's been, uh, been developing as, as things happen and they are building things. But there's no plan. Y la principal eh, dificultad en el gobierno del presidente Duque es que quiere desarrollar un proceso de reincorporación sin inversión de recursos. Los programas de reincorporación no tienen recursos, no están financiados. Um, one of the main challenges with the current administration of Iván Duque is that he wants to implement um, reincorporation processes without funding, and uh, that is not viable. So at the moment, all of these projects that have been designed have not received any funding. They ha haven't got any funds allocated. Y eh, la última reunión de bilateral entre el gobierno y las FARC fue el viernes pasado. Nosotros continuamos en diálogo y así y creamos una mesa de contingencia. Del co del, para la pandemia del COVID para hacerle frente a temas de salud, temas productivos, temas de género que se desarrollan en el... 
Um, last week, we held a meeting, a bilateral meeting with uh, the government, and we have created a contingency plan uh, to face the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we're dealing with topics of health, productivity, and also gender issues. Eh, frente a lo que, está lo que está sucediendo en la instancia de ese CIVI, es, es una situación difícil, la estamos acompañando porque es una situación política muy compleja. Eh, ustedes saben que Noruega y Cuba nos han acompañado en, en, el, en, en, en la implementación de los acuerdos y la política que se ha generado desde Estados Unidos y desde Colombia hacia el, hacia el pueblo cubano, pues ha sido difícil y, y, y entendemos que, que eh, eh, es un momento para apoyar y respaldar el gobierno cubano. And uh, with respect to the CCB, um, I would like to clarify is the commission for the uh, uh, can anyone help me here? This is TV, is la Comisión de Seguimiento. The Commission for the follow up and monitoring of and, and, and uh, stimulating of the implementation, something along those lines. Thank you, Gwen. So, yes, yeah, she said it's, it's been a very difficult situation with the suspension of this entity. Uh, they have been trying to support them, uh, but this is a political issue. As you know, Norway and Cuba um, supported the negotiations. And at the moment, there is a very hostile um, policy uh, coming from the United States uh, and the Colombian government to a certain extent towards Cuba. So she's saying that uh, obviously we need to support Cuba as, um, as a supporter of the peace agreement. Thank you, Laura. I see that there is another question coming from YouTube. So I will ask Lucia Mesa, our webmaster and dream team, <laughs> to ask that question. And again, invite you all to, to write in the chat if you have any question you would like to ask. Uh, we still have some time left and it'd be really important if you wanna ask or make comments. You don't need to ask a question. That's if you wanna offer some words uh, to to Laura and or to members of the FARC through Laura, this would be a good opportunity before we close this space. Um, Lucia Mesa. Yes, so Laura was talking that in this government, the President Duque uh, doesn't give a more budget to the reincorporation process. And now Mariana Valderrama from YouTube is asking uh, if within the reincorporation council, you have a mechanism to do a tracing of the budget given to these uh, processes, uh, maybe in the framework of the um, development plans, uh, territorial development plans or the reincorporation points. And uh, that, that's the question from Mariana. And I will also like to uh, ask for a comment from the, the news that we got last week or two weeks ago about the government signing a contract of... Uh... I'm going, that, that Tatiana is trying to catch up slowly. Okay. Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, but yeah, just one by one. Uh, let me just translate the first part and then we go back into the second one, right? Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Microphone. Bueno, el, el tema, bueno, mi amor, el, el tema del, de, de los, del presupuesto hace parte de la CECIL, es, es la que le hace seguimiento a los recursos de la paz, no, no del Consejo Nacional de Reincorporación. Sin embargo, pues nosotros tratamos de hacer un proceso de seguimiento no tan riguroso como el que hace CECIL. El tema de los PEDET que son los planes de desarrollo con enfoque territorial, son del primer punto del acuerdo. El CNR es una instancia del tercer punto del acuerdo que es fin del conflicto. 
con lo que les estoy contando, es un poco mirar cómo es la implementación de fragmentada, que si tú propones algo en el CNR, que es del primer punto, pues no te escuchan. Entonces, pues es también de las dificultades que, que se visibilizan. Ok, I'm going to try. <laughs> um, so, with regards to the budget, uh, Laura is telling us that this is uh, the domain of the SSCV. This is a different entity, and this is not the responsibility of the National Ring Corporation Council. So, what uh, Laura is trying to tell us is that one aspect corresponds to point one of the agreement, and the Ring Corporation is point three of the agreement, which is the end of the conflict. So this, what this highlight is the complexity of the agreement where different parts are now um, are very difficult to coordinate uh, because they have separate responsibility and there is not a, a mechanism um, basically was to, to coordinate this in a better way. Perfect, perfect. And the comment, Laura, uh, Lucia? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to oh. ask Laura. Laura for a uh, comment on the news for last week or two weeks ago where the government signed a contract with a marketing uh, company to to improve the president's image uh, but having budget or from the taking off budget from the piece uh, yeah so I just wanted to to uh, ask for a comment what is this en lo personal me parece súper difícil, fue una noticia súper dolorosa. Porque cuando uno mira las condiciones en que vive la gente en los espacios y las necesidades que tienen, y en lo que se pudo invertir en esos dineros, uf, eso duele mucho, duele, duele cómo se está, la importancia que se le está dando a la paz. Um, on a personal level, this is a very painful thing to hear. Uh, it is uh, very painful to see how the government is spending money that way when you see the needs of the people in the territories and when you visualize what kind of things could be improved in their lives with that sort of money. And that reflects the importance that the current administration is giving to the peace process. Laura. I would like to uh, start wrapping up because I don't see many comments uh, beyond some hashtags that have been shared, uh, that have been used by the social media of the CNR FARC. I see, and just call your attention for the people, if you want to see the, the, in the chat, some Sarah Cookman has shared some links to tiendaicomun.com where probably you can find some of the products of the FARC. But I would like to sort of, because of the last questions that have been asked, I think it'd be very important to try to first understand a bit more the National Council for Reconciliation, for reincorporation, sorry. So what is your role in the National Council for Reincorporation, Laura? Entonces, el Consejo Nacional de Reincorporación es una instancia creada en el tercer punto del acuerdo para hacer el seguimiento, no, para generar lineamientos para el proceso de reincorporación. Hay una participación continua del gobierno. Está el consejero Archila y el director de la Agencia de Reincorporación y Normalización. Andrés Stapper y por las FARC está Pastora Lape y René, René Medina. Yo okay. hago parte del equipo de FARC. Okay, well, the National, the National Ring Corporation Council, it's an entity that was created uh, in order to implement point three of the peace agreement in order to uh, agree on the guidelines on how uh, Rain Corporation was going to evolve, how it was going to be implemented. It's got a continuous participation of the government represented by the, um, um, sorry, 
the president of the National Reincorporation Agency, Andres Stapler, and the High Commissioner for Peace, uh, Archila, um, from the park. Um, we have Pastor Alape and Rene Medina. And obviously, Laura Villa is in representation of the FARC component. I'm sorry. Ay, valga, valga aclarar que la reincorporación se enfoca en temas económicos y sociales, ¿no? And it is worth highlighting that reincorporation focuses on economic and social aspects only. And within the team of the FARC, what is your role? Yo estoy eh, liderando todo el equipo de reincorporación social eh, y hacemos, via hacemos mesas de trabajo con el gobierno eh, para temas de salud, eh, temas psicosociales, temas de género, étnico. I am in charge of the social aspect of reincorporation. Uh, we create uh, different um, uh, working teams with the government, and we are in charge of dealing with aspects connected with health, psychosocial support, gender, ethnicity, etc. So, how has it been working with Andres Stapler and with Emilio Archila, the national advisor for post-conflict. How is it that process for you? Because they were on the other side when you were you know, in arms and now you are working with them. It's easy, it's difficult. How is that? La verdad, yo tuve como una experiencia en los diálogos de La Habana. Yo estuve en, en, en Cuba en la construcción del segundo y el, perdón, del segundo y cuarto punto. Y pues, pues si quieres traduce, sí. Yeah. Gracias. Um, yes. Well, I, I have previous experience of uh, working with, uh, with the government because I participated in the peace negotiations. I was in Havana and I took an active role during the negotiation of the second and the fourth uh, points of the agreement. Esa fue como mi primera experiencia de sentarme frente a, pues, a una especie de adversario. Y aprendí que lo que está detrás de ese adversario son personas. Entonces, pues yo no, creo que yo ya no personalizo como, no sé, yo no, no, no genero como, como aversión a las personas, sino me concentro en poder generar propuestas a políticas adversas que se presentan. Um, so that um, Havana was my first um, experience of working with a so-called enemy or adversary, um, but I've learned that behind the adversary, there is a person. And I've learned not to take things personally, I've learned to work with people in the solution of ideas that could be adverse to the peace process. Laura, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, has, I guess the National Rain Corporation Council continues to work. You have been having meetings on Zoom, I guess. How is that going? Has that affected the work of the National Rain Corporation Council or has made it uh, more efficient? Pues, eh, indudablemente, eh, han habido más reuniones. Es, es una tras, tras otra todo el día. En, en, ha sido como activo a través de las plataformas de, de internet y por lo menos en lo personal ha sido difícil para mí en mi rol de madre de estudiante y de, y de trabajadora en todo este proceso de paz pues se ha triplicado el trabajo pero bueno. um. Well, the, there have been many more meetings. Uh, I actually have meetings all day back to back using all these different platforms. And uh, 
personally, it has also tripled the amount of work that I normally have because I, I am a mother, I'm also a student, and I also have to work. So yeah, during the coronavirus, the amount of work has, uh, has been quite large. Sin embargo, hay que decir que pues, eh, el espacio del CNR ha estado activo, pero pues desafortunadamente es muy difícil, sobre todo, llegar a acciones concretas de soluciones. Yeah, Laura was just telling me internally that uh, although you, they have many more meetings, it's a little harder to come to concrete action. So they talk a lot more, but the, there, is, there seems to be um, fewer actions. Perfect. L Laura, thank you so much. I guess, you know, we've been talking for the last hour and 45 minutes. Uh, you've been dealing with your daughter there. It's been, uh, we can see what actually you have to go through in your meetings with the National Rain Corporation Council. Um, before I do a sort of wrap up, uh, some final remarks, I would like to ask you whether you would like to make a final comment or if you want to send a final message to the 33 people who are here still listening to you. No, yo quisiera reiterar mi agradecimiento. Arrodemos el diálogo. Realmente este espacio me parece trascendental. Y reitero que a diferencia de los demás acuerdos de paz, este, este acuerdo tuvo el apoyo de la comunidad internacional y este es un escenario que, que permite que la comunidad internacional escuche la voz de los firmantes del acuerdo de paz. Gracias. Um, well, um, I would like to reiterate uh, uh, that I'm very, very grateful for the space provided here. She wants to thank Rodemos el Diálogo or Embrace Dialogue. Uh, she thinks this uh, is a very important event because she wants to highlight that unlike previous peace processes in Colombia, this one has received invaluable support from the international community. And this is a space where you can see, uh, where, where the international community can, can see um, what it's being done in, in Colombia with this uh, peace process. So let me do a final wrap up uh, to all of you. First, I really would like to start by thanking uh, Laura uh, Villa for taking a space in her back to back uh, meeting agenda in Zoom uh, to talk to us, to offer her honest opinion and her honest approach to what is happening in Colombia. Second, let me thank uh, all the people who made this possible, Natalia Suarez, Lucia Mesa, who've been working really hard from the Colombian part of, the, uh, of things, supporting Laura Villa too. And then of course, the team of Rodemos El Dialogo of Rain Corporation, because they have made an incredible effort to make this a very, uh, I guess, a, a, an event full of solidarity and not just another event. So I think it has been truly important for that. Allow me to just offer perhaps two comments for the people who are still sitting here. The first is that we have seen in the last hour and a half, the very creative solutions that members of the FARC have come up with in order to deal with a very complex scenario to which not only reincorporation was difficult, but now the coronavirus pandemic has made it even more complicated, but they have found creative solutions to contribute to Colombian society and to try to continue in that process of reincorporation in which they are very committed. You have also heard from Laura Villa how they continue working within the National Rain Corporation Council how the work doesn't stop and how sometimes it's difficult to get to very concrete solutions 
for the problems that they are facing. And because of that, they have been asking uh, that the international community and Colombian civil society, who were the two sectors who inspired them trust uh, that continue supporting this reincorporation process. So I think that's the first comment I wanted to make. And the second one is we believe in Rodemos el Dialogo that in order to, for Colombia to become an example of peace building, that peace is possible and for other insurgencies to follow suit, it is necessary to strengthen the work from different corners of the planet. We cannot believe as a global civil society that we cannot play a role. On the contrary, we can play a role. We can take very small actions perhaps in our lives and make a huge differences for people who want to show that in Colombia is possible to solve our conflicts without using violence. Our invitation is to continue checking our website. You are gonna see in the few weeks coming ahead that we will have a donation button. And our idea would be to try to continue supporting the work that Laura and all the people in Colombia are doing to make rain corporation possible. We believe in peace building. We believe in the power of dialogue. And this event today, I think it shows the importance of being able to listen to each other, to ask questions, to be able to de uh, deconstruct our prejudices and to really become more active for peace building, not only in Colombia, but across the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you in the future again. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you, everyone. Tatiana, amazing job. <laughs> I'm exhausted, but thank you. Uh, thank you, and my apologies if I, you know, some information slipped through the cracks, but uh, I tried to do my best. So thank you for your patience, and thank you all for attending this event. Thank you, Laura, especially to you. And thanks to your daughter for sharing uh, her mom with us for almost two hours. Maybe we take a, a screenshot of with all the cameras on but for the, the future. The, yes. <laughs> Let's wait. Huh? Did you did you take a screenshot? Who? Cool. <laughs>